to uh, start uh, with a short clip, um, just a five minute um, WHO video. Um, actually, before I even get that, um, uh, my name is Asha Misoko, so <laughs> for those of you that don't know, I'm an assistant professor here in psychiatry and global health. Um, and I'm going to be the moderator today, so we're going to hope to have a discussion and I'll uh, So we're going to watch this uh, short film from the WHO, it's just five minutes. Um, and then I'm hoping to then start a discussion um, about some of the topics kind of stemming from that video. Um, and then we'll plan to wrap up by 1.30. So I know that there are people that have to leave before then, so um, you know, obviously feel free, don't be, don't be shy. I know it's a, it's a long event. Um, and, but the overall kind of theme of, of what we're hoping that people will um, get out of this event is to really be kind of forward and future thinking. Um, kind of start thinking about you know, what are, so we're not just listing the challenges that we're finding in global mental health, but how can we start um, kind of you know, dismantling them? Um, and in the process, I'm hoping that you'll learn a little bit about some of the things that are going on here um, at Duke, because there's quite a, um, a growing mass of people here at Duke doing global mental health. Um, so with that, let's, um, let's start the video. Mental illness is a largely neglected and invisible illness. Its symptoms cannot be detected in a simple blood test. It does not get passed on from one person to another by coughing or touching. And it's an illness shrouded in shame and stigma. Yet its impact is visible and global, with the poor and disadvantaged hardest hit. One in four people will suffer a mental, neurological or substance use disorder at some point in their lives. Yet many cannot get access to basic medicines or basic mental health care. They simply suffer in silence. <coughs> More than 75% of people suffering from a serious mental health disorder in the developing world received no treatment in the previous 12 months. Epilepsy, for example, affects about 15 million people worldwide, 80% who live in the poorest parts of the world. In Africa, nine out of 10 people suffering from epilepsy go untreated, unable to access simple and cheap anti-convulsive drugs. Patients are often taken to witch doctors subjected to violent beatings to chase away evil spirits. Yet for just five dollars a year, millions could get the drugs they desperately need. Mental health services in many parts of the developing world are clearly woefully inadequate. Mental health is largely ignored in global health. In many countries, funds assigned to mental health care programs are often less than one percent of overall spending on health. Patients not just in poor, but also rich countries are often forced to remain against their will for weeks, months, or even years in psychiatric institutions. Restrained by rusting chains, kept in caged beds, and denied clothing, food, and basic toilet facilities. Quite often, these mental disorders interact with other conditions like HIV and maternal and child health. In the developing world, almost one in five women experience significant mental health problems during pregnancy and after giving birth. Mental disorders simply push the poor even deeper into poverty. The time to act is now. The WHO Constitution defines health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Simple, low-cost solutions to the treatment and prevention of mental illness in low-income countries does exist. They're just out of reach. MH Gap is aimed at closing the gap, the gap between what is urgently needed and what is currently lacking. 
A huge gap that can only be closed through stronger partnerships, greater political will and increased funding. The goal of the World Health Organization, according to Dr. Margaret Chan, its Director General, is to see that mental health is integrated into healthcare systems. Governments across the world need to see mental health as a vital component of primary health. We need to change policy and practice. Only then can we get the essential mental health services to tens of millions in need. With proper care, counselling and medication, millions can be treated for depression, schizophrenia, suicide and epilepsy. MHGAP urges governments, international organisations and all mental health stakeholders to come together and work together. Human resources are particularly crucial for mental illness, especially in Africa and Asia. Caring for the mentally ill relies heavily on trained health workers not costly technology or equipment. Mental illness is treatable and curable. Treatment is affordable. We simply cannot afford to ignore the global burden of mental health. After all, there is no health without mental health. The time to act is now. Um, so, this is it's a very uh, provocative video. It's meant to sort of, you know, get people into uh, into action. Um, and there's lots of things in this video that I think could be a, a, a good starting point for our discussion. But one thing that I want to um, catch on to is that there's a sentence in there. They said that for... Um, the narrator says, for $5 million a day, we could treat millions of people with epilepsy and other neurological disorders. So they were you know, specifically kind of referring to epilepsy there, but um, kind of really generalizing that. And, um, and it's a very interesting idea, this, you know, is that, is that all it is? Um, is it just a $5 million problem? Um, is it, you know, just a matter of getting medicines to the right people? Um, you know, kind of what are the barriers? Is that, is that where we should be focusing? Um, and you know, sort of what are some of the issues around using medication? Is that what we want to be doing? Is that what we should be encouraging governments to be doing? Is making medicines available? Um, and is that what should be our focus as a community that's interested in global mental health? Um, is that where we should be focusing our resources? Is really the expansion um, of access to, you know, to pharmaceuticals that can be used um, for some neurological, um, neuropsychiatric disorders, including epilepsy. So I, I want to sort of use that as our uh, starting point. If anybody has any thoughts, reactions um, um, to that, about, do you think that's what we should be we should be doing? Maybe um, or maybe not. Um, yeah, having medications is, is clearly really important, um, but there's such a concern, there's such a, a fantastic lack of professionals who've been trained in, um, in treatment protocols, whether it's you know, medica med medications, but also in treatments that um, involved in psychotherapy and more in-depth treatment. There's just, you know, you'll have countries that have one or two psychiatrists and one PhD psychologist. And so there's such a huge lack. That, you know, and, I, and I think you know, we often go, like in HIV, you know, we, we go for the medications and we know that that is helpful in the spread. But um, I, being able to tackle issues where maybe medication is not appropriate, but also everything that goes around medication and having trained professionals at all sorts of levels, it's just a little um, disheartening to focus in that area. And and what and it's such a nice message because it is so easy. So it's, I could see it being so like, yes, we were going to pay for the medications and now we've dealt with that problem, so let's move on to something else. It's so it's, it's very tangible. Very um, and it's kind of like the exit, you know. It's, anyway. Anybody? Yes. Kind of related to the tangibleness, though, like it said it's curable, which <laughs> I think 
just kind of almost misleadingly tangible. Yes. <laughs> and I'm just curious, like, if the outcomes that we would see even in this country are like positive enough to drive policy. I don't know. I mean, they're positive outcomes, but I don't know if you can say that it's curable. Does anybody else want to chime in on that? People who, um, the psychiatrists in the room, So um, I, I agree with you that the choice of, of, of words isn't ideal, that a lot of these illnesses are not uh, curable, but are... Um, but are very much treatable and can, you know, some are curable, some are, are able to be controlled such that a person can live a very high quality of life, even people with severe uh, mental illnesses like psychotic disorders and bipolar, people that are, people that right now are chained up, literally are chained to trees or chained to a bed in their house, um, could um, function and, and be able to work and be, you know, members of their families and communities. So I think that, um, in our in our search for you know kind of tangible treatments and outcomes, I think um, I mean some of the, some of the outcomes to me are I mean it's so clear to me that that in some of these cases with with medication and with you know some psych, uh, you know minimal cost um, psychosocial supports and education things things like that that we could get people from being chained to a tree to being able to work and. And to communicate, or not to to contribute economically, and you know outcomes that are very very tangible. So, so you could argue that that's the first the first level. That, that, that given this enormous dearth of there being much of anything out there, that a that a, that a good first place to start is <coughs> kind of like the you know, working with extreme poverty. Let's look at severe mental illness, and let's do what we can with interventions that we know how to do and can educate them. Is that what you would say? <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would like to make a comment about whether or not this kind of condition is curable or manageable. Uh, um, well, you know, when we're talking about the non-communicable uh, disease, what we're encountering now, um, majority of them are not curable. For example, coronary artery disease. Once the patient has it, the patient has it. And the question is, how are, you, how are you going to manage the patient to the point that you know the patient will not have a recurrent event and the patient can still function at their close to normal level and still make a contribution to the society and then make their own life satisfactory, okay? So similar analogy applied to the mental illness, even very severe uh, schizophrenia in the past People feel like uh, they ought to go on disability or being locked in the backyard in the developing countries. But we know that if we give appropriate treatments and uh, they are very well managed and they still can have a, a level of uh, satisfactory personal life or interact with other people. So I think, you know, I hope that uh, I made a point clear to you that uh, between the curable versus manageable. I think one issue that is a problem with understanding these outcomes is the measure of functioning. So in <coughs> mental health, often your key outcome is going to be that quality of life, ability to participate in your community and your family. Whereas with heart disease or blood pressure, or even epilepsy, you've got some biological markers that are easier for people to, to understand. So I think that's one thing that is a gap in our work that we need to be doing is to let people know what those measures are so that we can then document the outcome. Um, yeah. yes. I think a little bit is to do with how you manage it though because certain people don't understand mental health as we would perhaps in the West, say in Africa. And that you can't just go in and say take a pill you'll be fine because this whole kind of cultural perception around the mental health in the first place so managing it in that situation becomes a bit more difficult than it would say in the US where you have the ability to give it to people know that that might actually help. So I think it becomes more difficult when you're going into
the Mitchell Hill is a problem in every country. Mental Hill is a problem in Durham, and there's a lot of things that are inherent to, to mental health. Um, principally, there's the challenges with compliance, as there are with many diseases, with getting folks who may or may not understand their own disease and understand the, the management of the disease and the need for compliance <coughs> is an issue. And her comment to somebody doesn't, someone believes that they're demon possessed, or their culture is demon this isn't going to just going to necessarily comply. Um, and so I don't think people ever used anything like like dots, those those sort of therapy. But that's sort of the that's kind of the mentality between committing people to institutions is that they may not understand their disease. They may not be capable to understand the disease. They require somebody to help them to manage it, um, as they might be a danger to themselves or the community. It's a, it's a problem everywhere that's inherent to the pathology. <coughs> In some ways, you're kind of talking about the further limitations of the really kind of medicine and, and pill approach is that um, if people don't see their condition as a biomedical disorder, then they're not going to um, interact with the medical system. So that is one barrier. Is if we want them to, then we have to, they have to reframe their um, condition as a medical condition. Um, and then there are issues of just sort of compliance and challenges of taking a yeah, <clears throat> the stigma issue is a really serious one, uh, especially in the Far East. I'm not that familiar with Africa, so I'll yield to those, but I'm familiar with the situation in the Far East. I can remember uh, in Singapore uh, that there would be families who had a family member who was, in the chi particularly in the Chinese community, who was severely depressed, and they would not take that family member <coughs> for help, even though, of course, Singapore has very good services uh, because of the stigma. And, of course, this is very much the case in China as well. Uh, I can remember, though, in tr trying to work with uh, cognitive behavioral stress management training in Singapore with uh, our life skills program that was, rather than you're broke and need to be fixed, was you've got stress and you need to learn how to manage it. Uh, we were told that you're not going to get these Chinese folks here to talk about feelings. After they'd gone through the workshop, these same people came and said, I can't believe it. These people are spilling their guts out. And we felt the reason was, was not because they were being fixed from broken, but they were being strengthened. And uh, this kind of different way of framing what you're doing may be one way of getting around that stigma. So, and I want to, um, that's an excellent point, and we'll, we'll come back to stigma specifically, because um, I think that's sort of a whole, a whole conversation, and uh, we actually, I was hoping in a, in a few minutes, we have another short clip that kind of um, very vividly describes this exact sort of um, thing that you're, you're describing so well. So, thank you. I, I think the, you know, we shouldn't blow by the issue of medication. The vast majority of folks who in this country receive psychiatric medications don't, aren't, don't have competent management and they're not, you know, maximally, uh, they're not optimized. So it's not a trivial <coughs> issue just at the, you know, the first juncture to say, well, folks would get pills. I mean, I think that's a little misleading is that if, if there's an actual you know, there, there's an actual process that you have to put in place for people to get really optimized treatment. It's not it's not as easy as it sounds, and so that takes a fair amount of work too. Right, right. So you sort of have to put an infrastructure in place and access and channels of distribution. Well, I had a comment before, but just off of the last few comments that that you know that maybe instead of this patient by patient focused approach, it really is, I think as you just alluded to, Asha, like more of a more of a systems approach, more of a community approach, that that there just needs to be a shift in terms of mental health as an integral part of the healthcare system as sort of destigmatizing and normalizing um, mental health conditions at a community level so that people get access to care so that the quality of lives of people with, with mental health problems are better because they're living in communities where they're seen as having a medical condition that can be treated and supported um, and, and so that the, the, the approach and one of the problems of the sort of give them pills appro like approaches that it is very much more on a sort of if the patient gets 
access to medication sort of things improved, but they're all the, the infrastructure to support it and the community norms to be able to support that that need to be in place. It's sort of misleading. It makes it seem a lot easier than it really is. Yeah. I'm from China and I um, I would like to talk about two points as to the development countries, mental health issue wise the um, and mental health education. People in like people in country like China have no idea what is that. The other is sometimes in China we have facilities and institutions to treat those mental diseases. But after people recovered from the disease, it's hard for them to go back to society. So it's also like a support group and to recover from this, to recover not, not physically, mentally, but from re recover their social functions. I think this is not. Because they've been extracted, they've been separated from that. Maybe one year or two years after recovered, they have already lost a lot of ability of re-socialization. <coughs> Um, I wanted to go back a little bit about medication. So I think that a lot of really important points have been raised in that, you know, certainly just throwing um, a lot of medications at a, at a problem or at a country, you know, doesn't fix everything, that a certain amount of infrastructure needs to be in place and education um, needs to be provided for patients. But I, I think that that has um, and can easily be used as as an excuse, like, it, well, it's too hard to get, it's too hard to get medication to people. People won't understand what it is and they won't take it. And um, my personal experience um, working in Kenya has been very much the opposite of that, that people um, with, you know, appropriate, um, you know, infrastructure in place and with appropriate education, people were extremely willing to take medication, were extremely adherent to regimens and, um, and, felt and, and we were able to alleviate a, a significant amount of distress. So I think that it um, it's important to recognize that that's not one, that's not the, the fix to the problem. It's one of many, many things that needs to happen. But um, I think it's easy to, to kind of gloss over like medications and say, well, that's just not feasible. People aren't going to take them. They're not going to be able to take them because of cultural issues or storage issues or any number of things. And I think that we, we know that that's <coughs> not true. Um, you know, with, which HIV, with HIV treatment, you know, that's, there were, I mean, that was, that's been wildly successful. People in um, in Sub-Saharan Africa are more adherent than than Americans are to to ART. So um, that's not necessarily the case. I think that that kind of we we can jump to those um, those kind of concerns as as excuses, and and it's important not to do that. Um, we're seeing similar things with treatment of diabetes in um, in low-income countries. It's been thought, oh well, we shouldn't even test for diabetes because it's unfathomable that somebody could take insulin. You know, somebody who doesn't have electricity, how are they going to have, you know, be able to refrigerate their insulin? And and it's actually being done. People there are storage methods that are effective, and people are actually managing um, diabetes and you know chronic <coughs> conditions that we would have thought were in possible for, for so many reasons. So I think it's important before saying this intervention, first of all, is, you know, it's not, it's not enough, but also it's not, even if it were enough, it wouldn't work anyway. I think it's important to recognize that it does work and it has worked in a lot of other um, instances. And so it's important to consider as one of many sort of interventions that need to be carried out. Are you going to talk more, are we going to work? a larger discussion about cultural competency and lay providers. I think that's really important in all of this also, so like the medications and pulling in. I think we have really good success in working with community we lay can providers. We segue into that right now, because I was going to bring it in in a conversation of this idea of <coughs> task shifting, um, which is related to that, and then we can, we can um, go in that direction, which is basically this um, this challenge of that there's not enough trained professionals. There's not enough psychiatrists in many of these countries, in pretty much all these countries, um, and there's not going to be. So it's not, you know, sort of, well, let's just train up thousands and thousands of psychiatrists. That's not something that's going to happen. Um, and so the movement is to up, train up mid-level practitioners, mid-level practitioners and even <coughs> lay people um, to do many things, um, you know, including things like prescribe um, medications, um, and, uh, but usually it's to provide psychosocial support and therapies. Um, and so the, this has been done at many levels. So you have master's levels, uh, people who are trained to provide cognitive behavioral therapy, 
Um, I'm working on a study now where these are um, high school level um, women in Pakistan who are providing cognitive behavioral therapy and seem to have really great outcomes. Um, and it, there's sort of a, a bandwagon thing where everybody says this is the answer. You know, is you don't need expensive psychiatrists, you don't need expensive doctors. We can just give training. You know, people can have a month of training or a week of training or you know, these sort of workshops are like a day long. Um, and they can go out in the community and they can provide psychosocial support and, um, and really do a lot of these things and it's so much less expensive. Um, and so I think there's a lot of models in that and there's some excitement, but I think, um, you know, there's, that's, there's also a danger in that and, and it's a little bit more controversial and I think it's, it's worth thinking through kind of what are the pros and cons as we're in the middle of this wave, this idea of task shifting isn't going to go away. Um, it's, you know, there's literally millions of dollars going into, into this all over the world. Um, but it, it ties into what, what you, you were saying a little bit about cultural competency of those, of those people and how much training. Um, you know, if you wanna. Yeah, yeah, so I was thinking, um, in particular thinking about the, the medications that there's been, um, success in, in different countries and working with family members and lay uh, providers who or health workers, people who are chosen by communities um, to who will help people stay on their medication, particularly with severe mental illness where it's so obvious that the person who was being locked up that they were you know, they really need help and so the stigma of oh we're gonna out this person isn't quite there. So you get people in the community who can help the person stay on medications, maybe a family member or someone else in the community working with, with various people who are have chronic conditions who need to have um, uh, interact with the healthcare system repeatedly and these are these are people who don't need um, the kind of medical training who really can be high school uh, or, or less but who, who have good interaction skills and can literally kind of help people flow back and forth appropriately with the, with the medical care system um, but then also with uh, and what you're saying, and you think of some of the work that we're doing with cognitive behavioral therapy with kids who've been uh, orphaned. Uh, and we now have a, after a, a pilot test that looked like uh, things were going pretty well in Tanzania, we now have a randomized controlled trial that's just starting in Tanzania and Kenya. And there, the idea is not to see if cognitive behavioral therapy works, or traumatic grief cognitive behavioral therapy, but that um, can the lay providers who were uh, college graduates in um, Tanzania now and, and who were supervised by our psychologist uh, here uh, in weekly sessions um, over, the, over the internet. Uh, can those people now train and supervise the next group in Kenya? And one of the things that my colleagues have made me very aware of is that need for not just to do, <laughs> you don't just do a one week training, but you have this constant kind of watching to make sure that people are doing, the continuing to, to implement um, the, the procedures and the policies, the practice, the, the intervention in the way that it was meant to be. Otherwise, you're just gonna end up not, not doing anything or uh, not being as effective as you could be. So we're looking at this, but I do think there is this big, I see a big danger in saying, oh yes, and, and we're dealing with it right now in Moshi with a group that wants to be trained. They want to come to a one week training and then go off and work with their kids who are in boarding schools and having a really hard time and they just want to go do it. And it's going to be, it's going to be tricky. I, I think it really is a very good point. I mean, I know your name and uh, what, you know, where you're working, and I think it would be really important for us to know the people who are doing this work and do so much for us to learn from each other and collaborate from each other before I say something. Yes, yeah, so I'm Kate Wetton. Um, <laughs> I'm a professor uh, in public policy, global health, direct the Center for Health Policy and Inequalities Research, and um, have, uh, I'm a population health researcher and much of the work I was doing in the in the 90s, just everything in looking at people's behaviors and their health behaviors and interaction with healthcare systems, so much kept coming back to um, mental health uh, that that's become a major focus of the of the work that I do, both here in North Carolina and the Deep South and in countries. Thank you. I'm I'm Wei Jiang. I originally come from China. I'm doing medicine, psychiatric practice here. I have a big heart in bringing things back to China. 
So, you know, was your, was what you just said, and I want to share my experience with um, what's going on in China as well. You know, uh, since the, the economic reform in China over the past 35-ish years, in China definitely has a significant increase in the significance of mental health. And in addition to medication, like I don't want to uh, repeat what um, Dr. Sherry had said, medication is absolutely working. And the people in developing countries do not reject medications. If we tell them this is working, usually they, they really uh, respond to that well. But in terms of psychotherapy, which is a significant component in the mental health uh, provision, so I, I think you know it really it depends on what kind of a resource those developing country people get, and then how can they use it, and a continuous supervision and um, work with them. I mean, as far as my personal experience tells me, extremely important. Like you know, recently I've been uh, working with the, uh, my Chinese colleagues in China. Like uh, they would uh, tell me that you know they have trained people to do psychotherapy. But they don't really know how to bring to the back set. And it, it's like a, a disengage. And also another very interesting phenomenon that's happening in China is that um, over the past um, several years, especially from the, the, the 2008 uh, massive earthquake, so a lot of uh, Western penetration into China, especially about psychological counseling. But fortunately or unfortunately, the one with the greatest resource is the psychoanalytic association. And they have the heart there, and they probably have some resources, so they started the whole thing in China. Many therapists in China got trained with psychoanalytic skills. And guess what? You know, we know very well. I, I think I better keep my mouth shut about that. So <laughs> then when you go talk to the Chinese colleagues, they have no knowledge about cognitive behavior therapy, acceptance therapy, you know, mindful practice, and you know, all those more advanced therapies, and have been proven by research data that is very effective, right? So I think you know, one of the things we can do as the organization here is, I think we can talk about what would be the best way to bring those kind of things to those developing countries, especially in consideration of uh, their cultural, like someone had commented, cultural and uh, language. Yeah. And all those uh, very challenging uh, tasks for us. And I think uh, that's a great point. I think one of the um, challenges with that, that that I think we should think about too is there's a need for us to do this very quickly because there's an urgency around it. Um, and we have evidence about what works here. We don't have as much as we would like to think we have about what really works there. So there's this tension that I've been struggling with of really providing you know, structured training in what we know works and having that quality control and the fidelity um, with allowing a little bit of organic development by the professionals that we train. And that depends on how we train them, right? It depends on if we train them in like acceptance therapy. Or do we train them in the principles about the therapy and take the time to develop that with them. And that takes a lot of time and we don't know if it works. It would be a waste of time if, if our therapies work and if we're measuring it correctly. And those are all these questions. So anyway, I think those are worth sort of grappling with. Um. Uh, yes, very good point. One of the things we find with our program <coughs> is that you go into a different culture and you start to train some professionals in the use of a given approach. It doesn't matter what it is. And you will find as you're training them that they will be uh, bringing to bear their knowledge of their culture. For example, in China, when you're listening, you don't look at the person directly, like we learned to do here. In China, you don't do assertion directly. You get uncle to go tell mother-in-law that daughter-in-law really can't come over every Saturday morning and clean your house for you. And every place, these cultural adaptations are necessary. The basic principles are the same, 
but it's very important to adapt to the culture, the, the basic, the delivery of the principle. I want to follow up on that. I think that's exactly where the tension is. I think on the one hand, being a global mental, we talk about the urgency of the need. Um, and then many of us being in the you know, medical community, there's a certain speed which is actually quite rapid, you know, with which sort of people respond to an acute medical need. Um, and so then that gets transferred to this, and it's, you know, very quickly being in the field, you realize that, oh, like all these rules are different, everything's different, and it takes a lot of time. And so then I think this task shifting is, is yet another, you know, it's kind of very, can be very seductive, um, as, a sh as it can seem like a shortcut, <coughs> but actually it's not if you do it correctly because the amount of time that it takes to develop it. Um, so it's not as much, it might not necessarily be that much cheaper because it takes a long time to, to get it right and that's where a lot of the tension, tension is. Yeah, I think that's right. I think though that enough small studies have been, been done demonstrating um, <coughs> effectiveness and acceptability in, in different communities that, you know, when grappling with the issue of urgency, I think, you know, you could, you could argue we, we don't know what we're doing and we need to step back and study this, but I think that we know enough to do something in, in a lot of areas of the world and I think that's, it, that doesn't mean that we have all the answers, but I think that what seems right to me is is kind of meeting meeting in the middle where you roll out interventions that you believe are going to be effective based on the fact that they've been effective in you know certain um, um, other areas or you know circumstances and then study how the process is going as it's being unrolled how acceptable it is and modify it as you go um, and learn from that and you know kind of then later iterations of of interventions would will be better but I think that you know kind of waiting to act until we think we have the right answer about what is going to be the best way to act I think we could wait forever so my um, my thought is we, we we do know some things we have so much to learn but we know some things that work and so we should act and and study and improve all at the same time <coughs> Um, so I have a, a lot of thoughts about this, and I don't think I'm going to articulate it well, um, but I hope maybe it will spark some discussion. People might disagree with me. But um, So I think the task shifting thing is really interesting, um, but I'm also not that convinced about its innovation because I just think, I mean, I think the point of not needing, you know, psychiatrist trained people to implement interventions is definitely important and I think effective, but I just, like, doesn't it just make sense if people talk to you that you're going to feel better and if somebody reaches out to you and talks to you about your problems that that's going to relieve some of your stress? It just seems so logical to me and it just, I don't know, like, the, I think one of the main components about therapy is just having somebody tell you that you're normal and that what you're going through doesn't make you crazy. Um, so that's one thing I'm thinking about and I'm sort of wondering is the goal to make everybody feel a little bit better or is the goal to find people with the most severe mental health issues and give them really intensive treatment because that probably can't be done with task shifting whereas um, if you're just trying to get into communities and get people to actually talk about problems sort of as someone referenced before with stigma, um, that's why I feel like this is an effective avenue just because people don't talk about things. So if you go into communities and say, it's okay if you feel sad, we can talk about it, um, and it doesn't have to be a psychiatrist. That's just helpful. I know, like, personally, when people want to talk to me about problems, I feel better. So, I don't know, maybe I just don't know enough about it, but um, that's sort of what I'm thinking. I don't know if it's all that innovative and, like, the new amazing discovery in this field, but. No, I would, I'm a psychiatrist, so I will completely echo what you're saying, which is um, coming from a model in sub-Saharan Africa and Kenya where very few 
psychiatric practitioners and where there's sort of coalesced or large um, academic or government related centers that the greatest intervention that I actually saw provided was a nurse who had done a minimal amount of training in mental health who was co-localized in an integrated clinic with HIV care where the patients would see their HIV provider, would get their medications, and then would go next door if they were exhibiting uh, psychic stress to just talk about their experience with their illness. And they, a lot of them have frank experiences <coughs> depression, psychosis, and that nurse was able to provide, was not trained um, in psychiatry, but was able to provide medication therapy, was treating epilepsy, was treating depression, was treating psychosis, but also at the same time would just sit there and could validate for that individual and their family their experience of their illness and what was happening. And it was amazing the amount of uh, treatment, even in a 10 minute window of seeing 50 patients in a day in that clinic, of what that was able to provide. And I think the question of being able to sort of capacity build you know, you can't sort of do this sort of trickle down. You've got to sort of go from the ground up and, and find people that are interested, that want to be able to sit down with people and talk to them about, just talk about their feelings or talk about their experience and validate the challenges that they're going through, um, being able to identify if they are suffering from depression and to be able to have lay practitioners, but as well as, I mean, nursing staff and nurses who can be trained to do just supportive therapy and med management can do leaps and bounds for care. And so I think just being able to provide that support um, can go a long way, especially just if we're talking about adherence, of people being validated in their experience and knowing that you know, taking three medicines a day is really challenging, especially when you're working for a family that doesn't know that you have HIV and you're trying to hide that and how hard that is. So well, that's I would what, agree. Sorry, yeah, that's why I think maybe I didn't articulate myself well. Like that's, I think that's amazing. And I just, but I just don't think that that's, the idea behind it of just anyone just talking and validating, that to me isn't innovative. So I think that's where I struggle with like jumping on the bandwagon of like task shifting and getting all excited because haven't we already known this? And I think it's important that nurses can provide that and they're not necessarily trained in a certain model, but I don't know. So I think ta one issue here is that task shifting is like a hot kind of catchphrase and yeah. it means different things to different people. Yeah. Um, and so if, you, if you're thinking about task shifting as, you know, just having all of these, you know, training all of these lay counselors or training nurses or training some, you know, a cohort of, of providers to, you know, provide supportive therapy, which is what you're describing. That's, that's not how I envision effective task shifting. I think one important component of an effective task shifting intervention is the recognition that, you know, um, somebody with a lower level of skill will effectively be able to provide um, intervention, wh whether it be supportive therapy or, you know, a basic, um, you know, brief, brief CBT or something like that. Um, or they would ref be able to refer for simple pharmacotherapy that could be managed by a nurse or managed by a primary care physician. But there's, there's this sort of, um, there's like a, a hierarchy or like a referral system in place where it's not just the, the, the cadre of, of workers being trained. It's not just that. It's also the structure in place where there's a recognition that if people have, you know, much more distress and they're not responding to that, or if they have, you know, psychotic symptoms, or if they have, you know, something that, that actually would require um, a higher level of care or would, would require um, somebody with, with some expertise or, or, you know, medication, that, that, that there's part of the system within the task shifting is that that referral is structure is in place. But it makes you know one psychiatrist effectively be able to cover a catchment area of many, many more patients than if than if a psychiatrist was treating each individual because maybe most of the peop most of those people actually can be managed by by lower level workers, but there's still the need for higher level you know, trained individuals. So I think there's it's important to think about what what we mean when we talk about task yeah. shifting and what it means to me is something that's got a number of levels to it, and I think would probably address some of the concerns that, that you have. Maybe not all of them. No, that makes sense. That was a good explanation. Kathy? Uh, hi, fantastic. Hi, I'm Kathy Sickerman. Kristen, you pretty much said what I wanted to say, which is I think it depends what you expect of your task shift E, right? So um, there are multiple purposes for, for how um, 
one may do that. The risk being that it's just broad community training and people go out and do it without any infrastructure. So one thing I've been thinking about that's, that's potentially an empirical question, which is what are the best systems of care for which this fits in? Um, because when I, when I was first listening to the discussion, I had this image, and I think you can think pro and con in this, like is, is when is the most appropriate approach to have mental illness be the disease <laughs> versus is it a, I mean, I came to this through HIV, so to me, by working it into um, a, another medical illness, it within it that has a potential system of care, it potentially reduces stigma and helps build capacity to address mental illness. So, so in some settings, the model may be to have mental health <coughs> be um, treated and become the norm to seek treatment by the context of other comorbid conditions. Versus, are there time? I mean, can an argument be made? And this, you know, it's sort of a philosophical difference in some ways. Is it important that we stand alone as the mental health providers? <laughs> and in, in, in some situations, maybe that is important that it that it's purely psychiatric care and it's not built into an infrastructure. I would probably argue for dealing with comorbidities since many people have other comorbidities. So it's just a, it's kind of a comment, a second comment about this question of task shifting where I think what the task shifty, where they may have the greatest role will depend on what structure they're within, which sort of begs this question of do we know in which situations what model might be most appropriate. Just to sort of build on that, I think it's really important that it also depends on how medicalized the treatment gets. So um, probably, you know, the answer lies in having a multi-pronged approach, but in places where um, kind of the medical approach to psychopathology is really kind of unspoken and really for reasons of stigma or whatever, no one is going to see a doctor for how they're feeling. Um, um, then the task shifting and has to be very different. So it has to be couched much more in terms of so, um, social support, and it might interact with the medical system, but very much in the in the background. Um, so I think that that's sort of another element to it. And then what the task shifty is kind of. Um, the power that they have. And I think several people have brought up the importance of supervision. And I think that this is something that very often does not get included. Um, and it's this idea that people are trained and then they go out. And I think maybe um, unlike some other disorders or some other uh, places where task shifting kind of that idea has taken up, I think in mental health there's kind of a larger ethical question in that there, we could be doing harm um, or the people who are not providing cognitive behavioral therapy and they kind of walk into something that is you know, way over their head, unless there is a system in place um, of really highly trained people and easy access to that, um, we could be not just sort of ineffectively treating people, but we could be doing real real harm. And so I think that's the other, um, the other part around, around task shifting that I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in terms of the, the mental health task shifting, my personal understanding of it, I really see that as the back to nature, back to the real life. You know, it's a somehow, you know, the development, uh, development of the medical field gets so segregated, you know, each it become extremely specialized. So, so we kind of like neglected the holistic uh, uh, of a human being, you know. My personal experience basically tells me that you know, almost quarter of a century ago, I came to, to Duke from China to understand how the patient was heart disease affected by their mental activities. So and then I found that the medicine psychiatry combined a training program after doing years of research. So and then I got trained. And now you know, we as a group feel like a, we're pretty well in, integrated, right? <laughs> so we take care of patients who have active medical problem need inpatient treatment, also have active psychiatric problems, severe psychiatric problems. So then when I talk to my Chinese colleagues, some of them just say, hey, can you just start this kind of uh, training program or service for us? So then when I sat down, I think about, can we really do that in such a simple way? No, because you know what? In the United States, we have this foundation. We have a much broad foundation there to, to get all the patients come to us at a very severe level. 
and then we got them stabilized as an inpatient, and then we send them out so they will have outpatient care, all that. You know, the, the mental health task sh uh, shifting is not just for developing country. For, for us, it's the same thing, you know, for Europe, for, for the United States, the same thing. But what I'm thinking is like, a, so we now, like for us, the group, we, we are really at the tip of the iceberg. Like we, we take care of very severe patients. But in order for the patient to get a very well, you know, service mentally and physically, we needed to build up a very good foundation, like a pyramid. And that's why, you know, you cannot have everyone who received the training at our level to do this. There is no such resource in this whole globe, right? So that's why we needed to train other people like who don't have to go through medical school to be able to educate people in general about what a mental health is, how mental health affects physical health, all that. And then you will have another layer, like a community service. They will recognize certain level and, and do like step by step. And then you from the up and down in that way. So basically that's, that's the very I see that. complicated. There's many levels to it, even though task shifting sounds I try to make it very <laughs> Um, one thing I wanted to come back to is, you know, so we're sort of saying that to agreement that it's much more complicated than it seems. And one thing that we've sort of touched on is, is one of the reasons why this is a challenge is because of the issue of stigma. Um, and so we've been talking about it, you know, a little bit on the macro level in terms of health systems and training. Um, and so I want us to kind of bring it back and think about it at a more personal level. And so I want to show another uh, clip. It's very short. It's three minutes. Um, and it's a, little, um, it's a little disturbing. So it's very kind of specific to a particular, um, to a particular family. And, um, and as we watch this, I, I want to sort of come back and have it and continue a conversation about stigma, but also um, you know, sort of thinking all these things that we've been thinking about, how would they help? Um, and Thomas and, and his mom. Um, I'm a dusty back road. And in my note, the head of the charity, Kenya Society for the Mecky Handicap, is on an investigation. This is what she finds behind the latch door. Uh, Thomas Patoke, tied to a steel bed, surrounded by pools of his urine. He's been in prison like this for 30 years. His mother has had no choice. His siblings ask whether we've wronged God because we're really suffering. I can't even hang clothes outside. The neighbors tell me to remove them because they stink. He can't sit with other children. They run from the house because they say he'll beat them, that he's mad. I tried to tell them no, but I came to realize that because they have never seen hardship, that is why they behave as they do. Angry and fearful neighbors have chased the family from village to village. Thomas's parents say despite scores of visits to doctors and hospitals, they got no help. Though I try to be strong, strength fails me completely. I'm tired of that burden. It's not a light burden. She tries simple things to ease his agony by giving him a bottle cap to play with. Or tying him to a tree when the weather is good. The mother has the right to live like any other mother. She's trying to say that by looking for help everywhere. Now Thomas is over 30 years old, and that's why she's expressing her being desperate and giving up and wondering when help can ever come. For how long will I carry this burden? Since I got married, I have never had joy the way other people have joy. I also feel that I should have been given a lighter burden. I have tried to encourage myself and think, God, help me, because I've carried this burden for a long time. All Milka can do is tether Thomas back in his cell. <laughs> 
and IBM Business Co. Um, so all of these things that we've been talking about, um, you know, medications, task shifting, treatment, it somehow it has to make it to Thomas and, and his mom, um, hopefully before he reaches 30 years old. Um, and one of the, so there's many things in this video that we could talk about again, but I wanted to circle back to this idea of stigma. Um, and it's not necess it's a combination of things. So it's not, this family doesn't have access to care. Um, so they might not be a doctor, but even if there was, it might not be very easy to go and overcome the stigma to go see that doctor. Um, and so I wanted just to talk a little bit about stigma and about whether um, there's one of the conversations going on is about whether sort of medicalizing um, mental illnesses actually increases or decreases stigma. Um, and I think many of us take for granted that education about a disorder um, is something that reduces stigma. And I think that there's some cases where that might not be the case. Um, and so I'm hoping to hear from some of you who maybe have had experiences with stigma and not necessarily just in other countries, but here and about what you think the root causes are and then how do we kind of overcome the barrier of stigma so that all these other systems that we're putting in place are actually gonna sort of make a difference and um, that people will be able to partake of those um, systems of support. Well, I can uh, say that what we found helpful in this regard <coughs> is to frame what we're doing, not as you're broken and need to be fixed, but you have a lot of stress or you have a lot of difficult life situations to cope with, and you need some training in some ways you can uh, cope more effectively with that uh, stress. And I think that's why the Chinese folks in our uh, workshops in Singapore were talking more freely than people expected about their feelings. It was because it wasn't to expose bad feelings. It was in the service of learning how to manage those feelings better. So not you're broke and we're going to fix you with therapy, but you have a lot of difficult situations to cope with in your life, and we're going to train you in some skills you can use to be better at doing that. That seemed to work pretty well in most cases. I, I, don't, know, I, I don't think that'll help Thomas, but, but uh, in the... Might help his mother. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think um, your point about sort of education about a disease is uh, really important, and I'm not sure. I think, I guess it just depends a lot culturally, because I think in the U.S. it works well to tell someone that they, to give someone a diagnosis. I don't know, I just feel like we as Americans always want to know what's going on and have control. Um, and I just remember a friend who said she had suffered from an eating disorder for years and never realized what it was until she was in abnormal psychology and reading the textbook and was like, those are all of my symptoms. That is me. And then she went and saw a therapist and got through the process. Um, so I think like, having something tangible to say this is something I'm dealing with and now I can resolve it. Um, but I'm not sure if that translates elsewhere sort of like you were talking about. Um, but I think both are important to think about. Yeah, I was um, thinking it might depend on the disorder. So if I'm having psychotic symptoms or seizures, which it's a sad topic about whether you know, epilepsy and Alzheimer's and those things should be lumped into this idea. But um, then a diagnosis or medicalizing that might be more validating. Whereas if I'm experiencing traumatic stress or if I'm experiencing depression, um, it might be more validating and less stigmatizing to see it as a stress reaction that is normal but distressing and interfering and therefore um, this training is needed, these coping skills are needed. So I just feel like we lump all these together and it's really uh, problematic. I'll, I'll just maybe build on that. And I, I approach these things as a medical anthropologist. 
And I think that stigma is, it's, uh, what's also crucial is that it's a social phenomenon. So um, in my research in, in Russia, um, stigma, uh, the stigma that was attached to the medicalization of, of mental disorders uh, in the Soviet period was also tied to the way in which uh, medical treatment became bureaucratized. So if you go to seek uh, care, your name gets put on a list. And that list is supposed to be confidential, but then somehow employers find out about it. So, so the, uh, that's just one example of, of the how stigma has a, a strong <laughs> social dimension that, that may interact with, with the nature of the disor disorder also. I was going to say, just in the work that we've done here in, in North Carolina with people who are HIV positive, that we, it was not uncommon and had substance abuse and mental health disorder. Um, it was n not uncommon for people to say, of the three, that the mental health disorder was the most stigmatized. You know, yes, it was substance abuse, and yeah, I got HIV from you know, someone else. And, uh, but the mental health disorder is a sign of weakness that you're just not allowed to have, especially if you're poor and struggling and you come from a family that struggles and you've got to get over this. And so it's very much internalized and you you believe that others are going to see you as being weak by having this. So I think what you're saying about you know differentiating, you know, if it is schizophrenia, that's different from uh, PTSD and from depression. And I think that and really in Russia, very, very it dovetails really nicely yeah. to the previous comment about how it's very socially embedded. Yeah. So in our society, sort of this idea of being a tough individual um, is very sort of that's our cultural value, um, and we're supposed to be tough and, and resilient. Um, and so that might be the source of the stigma in our culture around um, psychiatric disorders. But in another culture where that particular value isn't as you know, sort of as important, which is actually a lot of cultures where it's not sort of all about you and your own resilience and toughness. Um, it could be other things that are the source of, of, of stigma. Um, so it might can be really difficult for us to predict kind of which way, which way it goes or which way it doesn't, um, it doesn't go. Any other thoughts about stigma? Well, just I'm thinking back to Kristen's comments about link, understanding kind of some of the lessons around HIV and sort of the rollout of antiretrovirals. And one of the impacts of that is that with treatment, there's been reduction in stigma. And and I think that there's the potential for that as well with um, particularly sort of more severe mental illnesses that once, that, that yes, you can educate people all you want that it's a medical condition, but but if there is a medical cure, like we talked about, um, you know, if pharmacological treatment can sort of make one become a new person, then that that then has the potential to kind of change one's perception. So, so I think, I mean, and it's also back to your question that you can't wait until stigma has sort of you can't wait and address stigma and then you know address sort of the the access to medications that, that maybe it actually works in the reverse direction, that access to medications can actually address some of the more societal stigma issues. So the most kind of destigmatizing intervention would be medicines that work or treatment that works, but then people improve and then, then yeah. they're no longer sort of sick and acting and or yeah, have a functioning. Yeah. yeah. I'm talking too much, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm thinking about um, about suicide specifically as something that um, is is pretty heavily stigmatized. You know, suicide attempts and having had a family member commit suicide. I think these are things that, in certainly in our country, are very heavily stigmatized, and that's absolutely the case in, in lots of other um, cultures. And and um, when I when I was working in Kenya, I um, what part of what I did there was um, just kind of give psychiatry lectures to medical students. And um, at the end of one of one of the lectures, I asked them if I could have you know just a couple minutes of their time to pick their brains a little bit. And I was um, I started asking them what um, if they you know without getting into like personal details, if any like from where they came from, did they know of people who had committed suicide? And if so, how that was handled, like how that was handled in their community or in their you know, religious 
community and the, the experiences were so widely varied. I mean, I think, you know, initially there was like so many jaws dropped that I brought this up. People were like, you did not just say that word. I mean, it was, it was amazing. But then, you know, very quickly people were, were eager to talk about um, their, not, their experiences on a kind of macro, you know, on a community level. And the answers were so widely varied. Even just asking in one country about one specific topic, you know, people, you know, from one from one region of the country would say, you know, if somebody commits suicide, they're buried in the middle of the night and their name is never spoken again, ever. It's like they never existed. Um, and that was very different from, you know, what, what peop how people described it in other areas. And so it was, it was I guess this, this one brief conversation um, was very eye-opening to me in that um, it's stigma is something that I just can't even begin to wrap my mind around sometimes because it's, it's so it's so complex there's so many layers to it and even within you know individual it's just on what level do you look at it if you you know on different communities experience and stigmatize um, different types of, of distress and different illnesses and in such different ways and that the answer is not to ignore it which is I think a lot of times what my you know my knee jerk and most people's knee jerk would be because it's so difficult overwhelming and I don't know I don't know many answers but I do it, it does seem that talking about it like like you're saying Melissa and kind of just putting it out there is, is definitely a, a step I don't know subsequent steps necessarily, but I, I think that's that's really important. So for those of you that have worked with people with mental illnesses, do you, um, why do you, do you think there's something at the heart of stigma, sort of, is there something, the way that psychiatric disorders, um, you know, the way that people react to someone with psychiatric disorder, that's different from the way that somebody with HIV has, even back in the day where HIV was stigmatized, um, you know, is there, um, is it that people who have psychiatric disorders you know, are sort of more scary or kind of we don't know how to socially interact with them or um, do you feel that they're sort of a core with how people react to, um, to somebody who has a neuropsychiatric disorder that's different from other kind of disorders that they might, that you know, are those sort of medical disorders? Is there something special about mental health stigma um, or is it, you know, sort of stigma like any other stigma, the way that HIV used to be, or the way that, you know, sort of being an out of woodlock mother used to be, <laughs> or something like that? Or is there something, is there something else that's that's at the heart of it? I think it's very. I I, I think that with mental health disorders, that it's it, it's like a personality flaw. It's something that's that is inherently wrong about my being that is different from when there's something wrong with the system that keeps my being alive, my core being. When you get to a mental health disorder at, across the spectrum, it's like I've got, there's something truly flawed about me. So HIV, I can think about how they get this disease, and it's an embarrassment to my family, and it's terribly, you know, horribly stigmatizing, as we know, uh, but, it, but it's different. It's really kind of profoundly different, I think. And I think that's what, and communities react to that differently, and individuals react to it differently, uh, and makes it hard. Has there been a country or a culture identified that has the least amount of stigma about mental health? Very interesting question. Probably Scandinavia. Scandinavia. <laughs> well, I think it's. I think that stigma is probably not a unidimensional thing. I think that there's, um, you know, places that I can think of where people who have certain symptoms. Um, there's social structures that integrate them into the community to the extent possible. So in some ways they're less stigmatized because they're not sort of separated and, and there's a narrative that lets them belong <coughs> to the community to the extent that they can. So in some ways that is very, you know, less stigmatizing. Um, but then the flip side of that could be is that that person is never treated. Um, and so they continue to suffer because there's this other narrative. Um, and so then, so I think it's, it's probably um, a little bit more complex than, than sort of is it stigmatized or is it not? And again, it varies by, by disease. So for schizophrenia, there are many societies that have thought of certain types of schizophrenia being associated to being aligned with God and being, you know, having an, and, the, and people being treated very, very well by the community but not being treated. But then that's different from depression. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 
strikes me, we have this discussion sometimes on our team about um, the difference between shame and stigma. And in, in some ways, I think that um, it parallels what we were saying about the medicalizing certain diseases or not. Because the, sometimes I think the shame is what keeps people that with depression or PTSD or high levels of anxiety from seeking care because they can sort of function in, you know, in their internal world versus the, the question of the threat. I think some of the more severe mental illnesses, people get stigmatized because of the physical threat and the behaviors that people don't know how to interpret. Which, which is just different in, in sort of, I mean, if you think about the parallels we made of what we might be able to give a, a, a medical attribution to versus a, I'm not strong enough and I'm not resilient enough in our culture expects that, um, I mean, they definitely interact, but I think shame is quite different from stigma, and I just think that there's a potential implication of what that then means about how to open that up. It's just interesting thinking about it that, in my mind, they parallel this difference of psychological weakness versus um, biomedical concerns. Because I think, you know, I think we all probably have a different reaction to Thomas than we have to somebody who's so highly depressed they can't get out of bed and we never see them. I think there's just some different reaction that we all have to those two case scenarios, which I'm not saying you can compartmentalize them completely, but it's interesting to think about then what, what the social and community interventions are in responding to those two categories. Just to follow up on that, do you know of community interventions that try to do that very thing? Change the, like, what the normative beliefs no. are? To change what? I'm sorry, I couldn't. Like, what the normative beliefs would be about um, different kinds of disorders. I mean, I, I mean, you could take PTSD as an example of what's happened in the last few decades of what we think of from shell shock to now you can have PTSD because your parents didn't pay enough attention to you. I mean, it's like what we think of the PTSD diagnosis has changed drastically in three decades, right? It used to only be a war in response to war. That's where it came from. And now I think we're way too liberal with what people interpret as PTSD. So I'm not sure that's an answer to your question, but it's kind of just an, one thought about how social perceptions of a disorder have changed. I'm not sure if it's for the better or the worse. And, and it wasn't by a, an intervention intended to change. It was probably a naturally occurring event, which I'm actually not enough of an expert to know <laughs> why that, those, <laughs> that progression. Another non-intervention, similarly, I think with all of the um, commercials on TV about antidepressants, I think that has absolutely changed the discourse in this, in this country and how people perceive Depression and the need for the need for treatment and and the degree of comfort in, in discussing that with family members with with healthcare providers. So I think, you know, not a, not an intentional intervention and not necessarily a good one in in a lot of ways. But but what and you're it's saying it's probably somewhat related to availability of treatment, kind of bringing back to the other thing, right? So what's a good community intervention for that? Making it normative to go into a community mental health center and not be afraid to walk in there. Right, so my, my community interventions for the most part have one thing in common, whether it's about sexual behavior or trauma and sexual abuse. It's all about getting people to come together and talk about their experiences being led through an evidence-based intervention. But you still have to step forward and acknowledge, that's where I see the difference in the shame and the stigma. So, so maybe, I don't know if there's any, I don't know of any studies that say do this community intervention and look for a change in stigma, but there probably are interventions of other kinds that if those aspects would have been measured, you might see something. Yes. I think also you know, part of the stigma is also fear. Um, and if you look at you know, medical disorders or disorders that have been stigmatized kind of through history, like leprosy, HIV, there were sort of physical, like, there's a like, sort of stigmata of, of having an illness that could be sort of transmitted to me. So this fear of, of the of being sort of infected with something, of, of my safety net, my oneness, and my wholeness of becoming ill or diseased. And I think the hard part, of, especially with like the fear aspect for, you know, if you walk into, as a medical student learning medicine, if you walk onto a medical ward, there's not a fear necessarily that you're going to contract somebody's cancer. But if you walk onto the psychiatric ward, there's one sort of the physical fear of the patient who's talking to themselves and who's agitated. Uh, but at the same time, there's sort of this understanding that you know I could be, I could become that. This fear of you know 
I have my mind is functioning right now. I'm not. I'm not so. I can get sad, but I can't get so depressed. I can't get out of bed. Um, I sometimes have weird things happen, or I maybe see things, but I know that I'm functioning okay. But this person is so overwhelmed by this mm -hmm. disease that I think, in some ways, the stigma comes from the fact that mental illness as a behavior. We all have behaviors. We can have normal behaviors. We have our spectrums. But there's a fear that our own behavior could become so disorganized or so diseased or ill that, that these things could happen to us. That we're all personally vulnerable. Like right. That's what you're saying. And right. you don't necessarily have that perception for every medical condition. Right. And I think with, with mental illness, it's also not, you know, cancer is something that happens to you. It's right. not who you are. And yet, like, mental illness, I mean, there's this perception that that's who you are because what are you if not sort of what you express in your personality and the behaviors you have? And so it, it is, it's just, it's about identity um, as opposed to condition is sort of how it's perceived both by the, the person who's ill and others and because that's what you see of that person. Um, but that, that's where it's so different. You know, the and it's, and it's fascinating that so many of those medical comorbidities have a behavioral cause, right? right. So all the behavioral causes of certain diseases don't have the same stigma that yeah, right. Yeah, I was just going to go back sort of to the beginning of the discussion. Um, you raised just a question about stigma, and I always see stigma as sort of like the community perspective on things. And Kate was talking a little bit more about in internalized, which I think Kathy was saying was she sees as shame versus stigma, like the outside stigma. And I definitely agree. I think stigma 100% always comes from fear. But taking that a step further, where does the fear come from? And I always think it's just a lack of understanding because you fear things that you don't know where they come from, why they're happening, things like that. So I think, you know, like with HIV, the stigma was huge initially because I thought that if someone next to me with HIV was standing there, I could get HIV and oh my goodness. Um, and we obviously know that isn't true. Um, and I think the same is true for mental illness. I think, I'm not really sure, but from just personal experience, I feel like people don't understand that you don't have control over mental illnesses and um, I don't know, I feel like people with depression are really stigmatized in terms of like, well, if you just, you know, were more active, if you just were hung out with your friends more, if you did these things, you would be better um, rather than depression is something that is going on in your brain and it's not that you can like behaviorally uh, change it. So that's an interesting point, sort of linking it to how much we understand of the process. And I think that you know our sort of our brain is the least understood <coughs> organ of our body. So we don't actually. It's true. We don't actually know really, really what's going on, and that's and that's quite quite scary. Yes. Last I think it's also like you were just saying how it, mental illness often manifests as behaviors. So it's like, if you're not depressed, like you're almost doing something right by your behaviors. Whereas if you don't have cancer, it's not like you're doing something right by the way that you're, that you physically feel or act. In some ways it's sort of similar to obesity in our country. You know, that we stigmatize folks that are, you know, obese has become very stigmatized in the healthcare system. Because again, eating or having, um, those, you know, those are behaviors that we all have. And so that we feel like there's a reason why those people cannot be the way that they are because of the fact that there's a behavior that's tied into sort of the, the cultural normative behaviors. Because one of the things also, as an example, I think that's, I didn't understand when I went to Africa was how epilepsy got sort of folded into sort of mental health. And realizing that for lay people to have an understanding of how a seizure happens in the brain, but you can't, you can't see, you sort of see this fit that someone has. They, so they have neuropsychiatric symptoms that come on first, and then they have you know, convulsions. And in some cultures, those that have epilepsy are seen as shamans, or seen as having the ability to be spiritually um, touched. Whereas in our country, we've learned and understand sort of how the physiology behind it and see it sort of medicalized. Whereas in the developing world, where there's not access to a lot of that care, those individuals are oftentimes seen as, and I could imagine that Thomas could potentially have a seizure disorder, and that partly, you know, why he's been um, marginalized the way he has it had been because of because of seizures. And so it sort of gets folded into that about how that behavior um, is expressed to people and the fear of 
you know, could that potentially happen to me? Could that behavior, could I be overcome with this? Well, I wanted to thank you all for a really great discussion and thank you for coming out and for staying. Um, and if you want to become more involved in, um, in global mental health at Duke, there is a, um, a global mental health course that's taught in the spring um, by Eve Puffer and you can send her an email and um, if you want to find out more about that. Um, there's also on the DGHI website, um, we have a, a research site where you can um, sort of search by different topics and so you can pick mental health and all the research that's going on by faculty in the institute pops up. Um, and then I just wanted to um, shout out on the back of this, there is a, uh, a talk, um, uh, announcement for a talk on November 1 um, by Nadia El Sharawi that I just want to also let everybody know about and encourage you. So thank you very much and um, I'll see you next. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks.